of course, uh, moving along in 1 Samuel chapter 6, if you recall last week in 1 Samuel chapter 5, I subtitled that one, uh, Superstitious and, Superstitious and, uh, excuse me, no, Stubborn and super, Stubbornness and Superstition. And we talked about how the Philistines were a very stubborn and superstitious people. That God had been judging them and judging them and judging them. He sent the emeralds to city after city. And they didn't get it through their heads that the problem was is that they had the ark there and they needed to return it. And it was a very, uh, it was very, a very clear answer what needed to happen from 1 Samuel chapter 5. That they brought the ark in and then all of a sudden these bad things began to happen. Of course, we look at the fact that God slowly and progressively began to judge them more and more the more thick-headed and stubborn they became. If you recall, they, uh, at the very beginning, he simply knocked over the god Dagon in, the, in his altar. When they took the ark of the Lord and placed it in, the, in the, the temple of their false god Dagon, God just knocks over, the, uh, over the, the, the false idol Dagon. And you would think that would be enough to them to say, hey, there's something wrong here. Let's send back the ark. But of course, that wasn't. They set him back up. The next day, they come in early in the morning. The ark, he, uh, Dagon's knocked over again. This time he's got his head cut off, his hands cut off. They're on the threshold of the door. And God's just progressively getting worse. And you know, he's judging them worse and worse and worse to the point where, uh, you know, three cities are, are being destroyed with these emeralds. And uh, in, the, in the end there, it's saying that they're being killed with such a great slaughter that their cry comes up to heaven. And that's where we pick up uh, the story here in verse 1. And if I were to subtitle 1 Samuel chapter 6, It'd be kind of more of the same, more of the same of what we saw last week. We kind of see the story just continuing to play out. So I've entitled this one, The Hyper-Spiritual and the Simple. The Hyper-Spiritual and the Simple. And if you look there in verse 1, and it says, And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do for the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. So they're sick and tired of having this thing, and they decide that we've had enough of the... Uh, the judgment of God, and we want to go ahead and send back the Ark of the Lord to where it came from, and they're trying to figure out how they're going to send it. Wherewith shall we send it to his place? Now, here's the thing. They could have sent it back any way they chose. Because if we, if, you know, later in the story, in the book of 1 Samuel, we'll see that there's a right way and a wrong way to send the Ark, to transport the Ark. But at this point, I don't think it really would have mattered. In fact, at the end of the chapter, we see that they send it back just by, with some milch kind on a cart, and that's really not, you know, the Levites were the ones that were to bear the ark. The point being here is that the, the Philistines, the people, they could have sent the ark back. The point was, is that they needed to send the ark back. Whether they wanted to send it, you know, UPS or FedEx or get some milch kind together or whatever it is, the point, they just needed to get the ark out of their land and back where it belongs with the Israelites. And what this shows us, and this is what I talked about last week, is that the Philistines are really the simple people. You know, the, 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 the subtitle is the hyper-spiritual and the simple. The Philistines in the story are very simple people. They, they, it took them a long time to figure out what was going on. And it took them a long time to figure out, oh, it's the fact that we have the ark here, that we're being judged. It took them a long time. to Now they're sitting here wondering, well, how do we send it back? You know, what, how, how are we supposed to send the ark back? We know it's supposed to go back. We've learned our lesson the hard way. We need to get this thing back. How are we going to send it back? They're very simple people. And here's the thing, when you have simple people, that's when the hyper-spiritual come in. If you look there in verse 3, and they said, because what do they do? They, they, they call for the priests and the diviners in verse 2, right? And that's where the hyper-spirituals, they come in. You know, the hyper-spiritual priests, the diviners, they're ready to just step right in and go, oh, I've got your answer. I know exactly how to do this. Now, is what they tell them to do in the story, is that what, the way God wanted it back, the ark brought back? No, the Levites were supposed to bear it. Did God anywhere say, Hey, you need, to, you need to return the ark with some golden images of mice and emeralds before I'll accept it. No. That came out of the heart of man. That was their decision. That was something that they came up with out of their own vain imaginations. And what you see is that the priests here, they represent you know, these hyper-spiritual people that just want to add uh, you know, things to, to, to God's ways just for the sake of you know, uh, you know, just making themselves look more spiritual than they really are. He says in verse 3, And if ye send away the ark of the, Lord, uh, of the God of Israel, send it not empty. Well, why not? Why not send it away empty? You think God's holding them for ransom? Is that what God, God's doing all this because he wants money? Because he wants golden mice and emeralds? I'm not, pretty sure he's not interested in any of that. And he's saying, Send it away not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering, and then ye shall be healed. And it shall be known unto you why his hand is not removed from you. 
So you have these simple people that can't just figure out, just, just send the ark back. It's that simple. And then you have the hyper-spirituals coming in saying, oh, send it back, but don't send it away empty. Let's sit down and let's make these golden mice and these golden emeralds and show everybody how much, you know, we, we just want to offer this sacrifice to God. They don't want to offer sacrifice to God. They just want to appear more spiritual than they really are. He says there at the end, then you shall know the reason why his hand is not removed from you. Has anybody that's been reading the story wondering why God's hand is not removed from them? Everyone who reads the story understands perfectly well the reason why God's hand is heavy upon them and is not removed from them is because of the fact that they're in sin. Because they're trying to put their, they're trying to take God and add them to their false god, Dagon. They're, trying to, they're, they're hanging onto the ark. They're, they're taking something that belongs to God and they're holding the truth in unrighteousness, as it were. So if you would, keep something there in 1 Samuel 6, but go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll look at a very familiar passage. <clears throat> so rather than just face the facts, rather than just say, hey, we got the ark, it, shouldn't, it doesn't belong here, we're being judged, let's just get it back, you know, let's just send it back to where it came from, and the, the, the hand of God will be removed, God will be pleased, we won't have any more of this judgment. Rather than just face the facts that they'd made a mistake, that they'd done wrong, they dig in their heels, they do like we talked about last week, they become stubborn, right? And we talked about the fact that when a person becomes stubborn, they're, become, they're willingly ignorant, and they become superstitious, they become stupid, right? And then when that happens, then the hyper-spirituals can move in, and they can start to make up all these other extracurricular things that God never required. And, and put another burden upon people that, that God doesn't even interested in. I mean, how, I mean imagine being the, the, art, art, the artificer back then, the guy who was responsible for making these images. You know, someone comes to you with gold, hey, we need you to make an image of a golden emerald. Oh, great, my, the opus you know, of my life, my life's work has led up to this. I'm making a golden image of emeralds and mice. You really think that's what he wanted to do? It's a waste of time and money and energy. <coughs> and these, these people, these hyper-spirituals are just putting a burden on people that does not belong there. And why is that happening? Because the people are simple, because the people are stubborn, because the people are superstitious. Rather than facing the facts, they just allow themselves to be open to attack and to be taken advantage of by hyper-spirituals. Look there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. It says, This know also, then the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous, boasters, prouds, blasphemers, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Now, one thing we need to understand about this passage here is that this... In, these people that are being described, these, uh, these people that should come in, in, in perilous times, these men are all of these things. These, these wicked people, they're all of these things. It's not like, it's kind of like Romans 1, where it describes everything that those people do in Romans 1, and it says that they're being filled with all unrighteousness. Okay, I don't think every time somebody's disobedient to their parent that, you know, they're just some reprobate, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the kids won't listen, so all of a sudden they're just this evil, wicked seducer, you know. That's not it. They're, the people that are coming in the end times that we even see about us right now, they're all of these things, right? And one of the things that they are, in verse 5, it says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. It's kind of like these priests in our story. They're the diviners. They're the spiritual types, right? They're the, they're the ones that are going to move in. They have all the answers for your spiritual question. How are we going to return the ark? How do we get the judgment of God from off us? Oh, well, we, you know, we have a form of godliness and we know exactly how to take care of this. Make golden images of your emeralds and your mice. I mean, I think they just made that up right on the spot. It's that, I mean, you ever think about how ridiculous that is for them to have told them that? That's your solution? Make golden images of these things and send them back? I mean, the gold, how about just the gold? <laughs> they could have just said, well, just put some gold on there and send it back. You know, but now they're like, no, you need to make these images. You got to go above and beyond. And it says here in verse 5 of 1 Tim 2 Timothy 3, having a form of godliness but denying the power of, from such turn away. You know, people need to turn away from these types, from the hyper-spiritual types. People that just want to lay, you know, unnecessary burdens upon you. 
that want to just, you know, make you go above and beyond what God actually requires. From such, turn away. These, people, these are the type of people, all they're going to end up doing is wasting your time, wasting your energy, wasting your resources. I mean, think about the story here. That's what they're doing. They're causing these people to just waste all that gold. God didn't ask for that gold, but these hyper-spirituals like, oh, you got to make that gold. Uh, God's not going to accept it. You know, unless you put some gold, I mean, anybody could just send back the ark. Anybody could just, you know, attach some milch kind to it and send it back. No problem. But, you know, we're more spiritual than that. We're going we're gonna to put some golden mice in there. We're going to put some golden emeralds in there. And it's a waste. It's a waste of all that gold. It's a waste of everybody's time that had to make those things. It's a waste of energy. You know, the hyper-spirituals and, and others, too, there's always somebody who's ready to just step in and give you bad advice. And that's what these people are doing. They're just bad advice. Make, make these golden images. It's, it, no, that's wrong. God doesn't need any of that. <clears throat> if we will go ahead and move on here in our story, he says, uh, he says in verse 3, And they said, If you send away the ark of God, send it not empty. Because well, that would be a real shame, wouldn't it? That would just be terrible that, that God just got what he wanted, which was the ark. Send it not empty. But in any way, in any wise, return him a trespass offering. So here they are, they're saying, well, we're going to atone ourselves for God. And what are these people? These people are unsaved, wicked heathens. That's what the Philistines are. We saw last week that they're just, they've been worshiping, you know, this false god, you know, for just generations, despite all the, the terrible things that happened as a result. You know, Dagon was there. They were worshiping Dagon when, Sam, when uh, Samson knocked down the pillars and killed them all. You know, in the, this story happens where they're setting up the, the Ark of God and the Temple of Dagon. All these terrible things happen. They keep on worshiping Dagon. Then they kill, when they kill Saul, where do they pin up his body and his head? In the temple, or they set up his head in the Temple of Dagon. <clears throat> so these people are wicked. They're, unhe they're heathens. They're unsaved. But they're going to tell these people how to, you know, appease God. How to return a trespass offering. Here's the thing. God wants nothing to do with the offering of the unsaved. Amen. God's not interested in it. But if you would, go over to uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 15. Actually, go to Proverbs chapter 21. And there's a lot of people today, you know, maybe even well-intentioned people whose hearts, you know, are in the right place, quote-unquote, or maybe not that are adding, you know, trying to make sacrifices to God that he never asked for and that he's not interested in. A lot of people that are making, you know, spiritual golden emeralds and spiritual golden mice today and offering up to God for a trespass offering. God's saying, I never asked for that. I don't want any of that. You have a lot of churches today that are teaching a lot of extra biblical things that just aren't found in the Bible. They're saying, oh, you got to be baptized. You got to take the sacraments. You got to you got to live a good life. You got to keep the commandments. You got to do this. You got to do that. That's all golden emeralds. Yep. That's all golden mice that God's not interested in. That's not, and, we're, and the reason why people get caught up in that is because they're listening to hyper spiritual types who don't know God, who don't know this book, who don't believe this book, and they're being taken advantage of because they're simple, because they don't understand the Word of God. <clears throat> You know, the priests, they should have just admitted their ignorance and said, you know what, I, we don't know what to do. Just send the ark back. We don't know. We, I don't have an answer. That would have at least been the honest thing. But they're so hyper-spiritual, they have to make up something. Well, let's make some golden emeralds. Let's make some golden mice. That sounds good. What the people should have done is ask the Israelites. You know, send a guy over there under a banner of truce and say, hey, we want to return this. What do, what do we got to do? Right. Do you want to bring some Levites down and get it and do it the right way? I don't even think God was interested in that. He just wanted it gone. They just, he just wanted it back. But instead, they're going to the wrong source. They're going to these false prophets. <clears throat> and they end up just wasting time and money. And if you look there in Proverbs chapter 1, look, ver look at verse 27. The Bible says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. You know, wicked people can be religious. There's plenty of uh, religious people out there that are wicked to the core. Right. There's, you know, the saying goes, many a black heart is veiled under a white vest. There's plenty of people out there that they have the form of godliness, but they're wicked as hell. And they'll make sacrifices. They'll so come across as very godly and holy. And they'll, they'll make all these sacrifices so-called to God. 
And God calls it an abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? People that are knowingly you know, leading other people into hell with their false, you know, their false religions. Go over to Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. This is repeated in Proverbs chapter 15. He says in verse 8, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The, wicked, uh, the way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Look at verse 10. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. You know, they, the, they had been reproved pretty severely in the story, hadn't they? They were doing things the wrong way. They had the ark that didn't belong to them. They, they didn't even need to take it in the first place. They, you know, they, they brought it back to them. And then they're just being corrected and corrected and corrected. And it's pretty grievous. And they're being chastened. <coughs> and the Philistines, you know, they refuse to send the ark back. And as a result, they suffer for it. Even to the point of death, to where God's just killing people. God's just, you know, the last, if you recall the story last week, God's just straight up killing people. Because of, their, because of their stubbornness. Because they did not like to be corrected. Because of correction being gravest unto them. And because that they were forsaking the way. Now, it's one thing to be grieved by correction. Right? It's one thing to be grieved by. If, you know, in Hebrews chapter 12, I won't have you turn there, but it says, No chastening for the present seemeth jo to be joyous, but grievous. Right? And we understand that all of us as God's children, those of us that have been put our faith in the, in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, those of us that are saved by faith through, you know, through Christ, we are God's children. We're born again. Amen. Right? The Bible says, you know, except, a man, uh, except you become His children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And how do you do that? You know, un, un, those that believe, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. So faith is what causes us to be born again. You know, in God, we're, we're His child. And God corrects His children. Go read Hebrews 12. There's, you know, every son whom he receive, he chasteneth every son whom he receiveth, and no son, there is no son whom he chasteneth not. And if you be without chastisement, then ye are bastards and not sons. But it says here in Hebrews 12 that no chastening for the present, si the present seemeth to be joyous. Look, all of, all of us as God's children that are born again are going to go through some kind of chastening because nobody in this room is perfect. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. If anybody wants to raise their hand and say I'm perfect, well, I'll call you a liar on the spot. <laughs> But no one here is perfect, and we're all going to be chasing, you know, some more than others because some people learn at different rates or, you know, don't, don't learn the first time through. And, but it, to whatever degree we're, we're chasing, it's not joyous. It says it's grievous, isn't it? It's one thing to, be, to go through chastening and to be grievous to you. It goes on and says, Afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So God chastens us not because he's just trying to get his kicks, but because... In the long run, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. God starts to chasten us. We get the sin out of our life. We start living right. We start living for the Lord, doing, you know, keeping His commandments, so on and so forth, and we have joy and peace from that. You know, that's, that's the end of that. So it's one thing to be grieved by correction, but it's another thing to hate reproof. It said there in our verse in Proverbs 15, and verse 10, Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. You know, it's one thing to be corrected and have it, oh man, that's grievous. It's no fun. You know, the, the, no kid is looking forward to a spanking. If, you know, if they have any sense in their head. They're not looking forward to that. It's grievous. But it's another thing to hate reproof. You know, hating reproof, it says here, he that hateth reproof shall die. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter uh, 29, verse 1, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. And that's what's been going on with these Philistines. They've, you know, it's not just that they're being corrected and it's grievous, it's that they hate reproof. They're hating the fact that, you know, God's chastening them for having the ark there, and all they need to do is just send it back and admit that they're wrong, that they messed up, that the ark doesn't belong to them. That God, you know, doesn't belong in, in with their idol. Right. <coughs> but they hate that. They don't want to admit they're wrong. They hate reproof. And as a result, a lot of people died, didn't they? <coughs> so we see here in our story, and if you would go back to uh, 1 Samuel 
chapter 6. The, the priests, you know, these are the, these are the hyper-spiritual. And the people, they're very simple. They're, they're not, they, it took them a while to kind of get the message from God. And God, if, you know, was very patient with them. God was kind of gently at the beginning rebuking them, and then it got really severe, and they should have been able to figure this out. <clears throat> it says in, uh, in Romans chapter 16, verse 17, now, brethren, and he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they are such that, uh, that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. You see, sim simple people, and simple just meaning not having the knowledge that they need to have, that they should have, being ignorant. They are, they, people who are simple leave themselves open to being deceived. <clears throat> and hyper-spiritual people, you know, these false prophets like the Philistines, they love to move in and take advantage of people like that and get them to do all kinds of stupid things that they don't need to do and waste everybody's time and energy and, and money and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Wicked people take advantage of simple people. They prey upon the weak. That's why he's saying, you know, mark them which cause divisions and conf uh, offenses contrary to the doctrine you have learned and avoid them. Just avoid these type of people. For they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. They might come across as godly. They might come across as spiritual. They might come across as religious. But they're not serving our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not where their heart is. It goes on and says, but their own belly. They're the types that just want to just satisfy their own lusts by deceiving the simple, by deceiving the hearts of the simple. By getting them, I'm just going to preach lies and tell you lies and put burdens upon you so that you'll just put money in the, in the plate and then I can just live, you know, high on the hog and take advantage of, of people. And, it's, and how do they do that? By good words and fair speeches. That's how they do it. Oh, you need to make golden emeralds. You need to make golden mice. Yeah, that sounds good. Gold. Yeah, God would be really impressed with that. You're right. I don't think I'll do that. You're simple. You're just falling for a lie. <clears throat> the Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Look, there's a lot of people out there today a lot of, that are coming in the name of Christ, a lot of antichrists, a lot of spirits that are out there, a lot of false prophets that are gone out in the world, and they're looking to deceive the hearts of the simple. Our job is to try those spirits. And how do we try them? With the Word of God. We listen to what the preacher or whoever is, tr is trying to tell us something, and we see if it lines up with this book. We're like the Bereans, who are more noble than those which are in Thessalonica. Why? Because they search the Scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. I mean, Paul told the Corinthians, he said, I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. What's going to make you wise spiritually today is if you judge what is said. If you judge what I say. Just like Paul wanted his, the people that he was preaching to to judge what he said. You know, I'm imploring you tonight. Judge me. You know, I'm not going to be one of these people. Oh, don't judge. No, go ahead and judge me. Go ahead and take the word of God and make sure what I'm saying lines up with it. Because that's going to keep you from being simple. That's what's going to keep you from being deceived. And we already, you know, 1 John 4 is clear. Many false prophets are gone in the world. You know, the warning of, of Romans 6, you know, that there, there are people out there that want to serve their own belly. And good words, fair speeches, they're going to say nice things. It's going to sound real good. You know, they're going to have all the religious flair. It's going to be real impressive. But it's all there to deceive you, take advantage of you, and lead throngs of people into hell. And the people that fall for it are the simple, the people who don't take the time to make sure it lines up with the Word of God. And try the spirits. Wise people cannot be taken advantage of. You can't pull one over on them. People who read the Bible, people who, who are born again and, spirit, and have the Spirit of God in them, leading them into all truth, and reading this book every day and knowing what it says, you're not, they're not going to get deceived. Or it's going to be really hard to do it. And they, they probably won't stay deceived. They'll figure it out as long as they keep reading, keep studying, and keep discerning. The Bible says, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent looketh well to his going. 
The Philistines are a perfect example of that in the story. They just believe every word. Oh, make some golden emeralds. That makes a lot of sense. You know, th no, th th there's no need for emeralds. There's no need for golden mice or any of that. Just send it back. But what do they have? They have people who just want hyper-spiritual people, people who have a, a, a form of godliness, these, these, these priests, these seers, that are just telling them lies. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 6, and it says there in verse 4, it says, Then they said, What shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was upon you all and on your lords. So they don't, you know, and then they go along with this. Simple people, they get deceived and they just go along with it. And this is bad advice. This is bad doctrine. And that's the danger of people who are stubborn and people who are just you know, not willing to admit that they're wrong, as I mentioned last week, is that other people around them get hurt. And when people are simple, other people around them get hurt. They get hurt, everybody else around them gets hurt as well. They end up just wasting all this time. It says there in verse 5, Wherefore ye shall make images of your, em your emeralds, and images of your mice that mar the land, and ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Peradventure he will lighten his hand from off you, and from your gods and from off your land. Now that sounds like a real nice speech, doesn't it? But it's, it's just deception. It's just lies. It's just made up. Wherefore do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and kill and let, and, 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 excuse me, and Pharaoh, uh, and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he had wrought wrong, uh, wrongfully, wonderfully among them. Uh, did they not let the people go and they departed? So now he's, they're kind of guilt tripping him. You guys are so hard hearted. Now therefore make a new cart. Does it matter what kind of what cart they get? Just grab a cart, put the thing on it, and send it home. Get it out of here. That's the problem. But they're ignorant. They're stubborn. They're simple. They don't get it. And they're being taken advantage of by these hyper spiritual priests. Make a new cart and take two milch kinds. Not just any milch kinds, but two uh, ones, uh, two that uh, where no ha yoke hath come on them, right? On which there hath no uh, come no yoke. So now it's getting real specific. It's like, man, well, first of all, someone's going to have to sacrifice these. Do you think they're just going to, there's just, you know, these, these kind that have had no yoke on just laying around? Somebody's going to have to give that up. Maybe somebody was planning on, you know, using that animal for their family, to feed their family, and so on and so forth. Now somebody's got to give these, oh, I guess, well, that's what he said to do. I mean, after all, you know, he's the priest. He must know what he's talking about. Let me just give up my, you know, give him up. Man, my new cart. You want my cart too? My brand new one? Just got this cart from the dealership. You know, the spokes are nice and shiny. Right? And now you want me to just give this thing up? Yep. Because if you don't, you know, you're just a hard-hearted, wicked person. What you are is simple, and you're being taken advantage of by somebody who appears godly, but is really just in it for their own, their own gain. And tie the kind to the cart and bring the calves home from them. And take, verse 8, and take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold which returned for him for a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof and send it away that it may go. This is big, long, elaborate plan that just didn't even need to take place. But here's the thing. The simple people, they go right along with it. Say, yep, okay, well, let's get that cart. Let's get some kind. Sorry, sorry, Bob. Kind's got to go. Sorry, Frank, I know you like that cart. You're really looking forward to using it, but emeralds, man. <laughs> Want to get rid of these or not? The priest said we got to get rid of the emeralds. <clears throat> and look, all of this is just from the imaginations of the priests. It's all just made up. It's not a commandment of the Lord. Go find me the passage where it says, and thou shalt return the ark with golden mice and emeralds on new carts with milch kind that have never had yoke on them. It's not there. And all this resulted in is just one giant waste of everybody's time, everybody's energy, everybody's abilities. And what's really ironic about all this is that the Philistines, they could have just left the ark there when they found it. Remember when they, because they brought it back after they defeat the defeat of the Israelites. Remember, remember when they were going to war and, uh, in, in chapter 4, they're, they're fighting, 
And the Philistines, they see the ark come into the, the camp of the children of Israel and they cry out for fear. They say, oh, we're doomed. We're done. Quit you like men. Right? They think they're, this is it. They're, gonna, they're going to their death. Out, they're going to go kamikaze style at the ark. And they're done. But they end up, because God's judging Israel for their iniquity, they end up defeating them, kind of unexpectedly. And then they decide to grab the ark, which was their big mistake. I mean, think about it. They could have just defeated the enemy, you know, and had a really, I mean, they thought they were done for. They thought that was it. We're dead. And then they come out victorious. Like, wow, what a surprise. They could have gone home and had a great day. They could have gone home and never gotten any golden emeralds and never had any mice in their land. No one would have had to give up their, uh, their, their nice new shiny cart. No one would have had to give up their milch kind. No one would have to sacrifice all this gold. There would have to be some guy sitting there chipping away making an emerald. And none of that would have to happen. But what did they want? They wanted to take that ark as kind of a trophy. That's, you know, that's just something I thought I found ironic in the story. And it says in verse 9, And see, if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh, and then he hath done, done this, uh, this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. It, this is just crazy. Like, this is the, and this goes back to what I was talking about last week. People who get, are stubborn people become superstitious. And they start to think weird things and come up with really strange teachings that aren't, have no basis in reality. They say, well, you know, if, you go, if it goes back to Beth Shemesh, then we know that you know, God is judging us. But if it goes up some other way, then this was all just a big chance. Really, it was just a big chance that one day he went into the temple of Dagon and, the, and the, his idol, the idol was knocked over. And it was just a chance that the next day he went there and it was knocked over again and his hands and his head were cut off and set upon the doorway and the threshold. It was just a chance that town after town that the ark came to was just afflicted with emeralds and mice. That's just all a chance. <clears throat> you know, some, and this just goes to show you that you know, people don't want to acknowledge the judgment of God sometimes. They don't want to admit they're wrong and they surefire don't want to admit the fact that God's judging them. Because if you had to admit to the judgment of God, then you'd have to admit that you're wrong, that you're not right with God. That's the country, that's the problem this country has. We'd rather stand up and say, oh, God bless America rather than God have mercy on America. Because if we said God have mercy, then we'd have to acknowledge the fact that you know, God's judging us. And God is judging this country. And I don't think I really have to make that case tonight. I think we all get that. I don't think we all have to look very far to see the judgment of God in this country. <clears throat> and people don't want to admit it today. Because doing so is an admission of guilt. They would rather see this cart go off some other way and just say, oh, it's just a chance. Whew. As if that's any kind of relief. I mean, they, they're still dealing with all the judgment, all the things that happened. Whether you want to acknowledge the source or not, they still got the emeralds, they still got the mice, they still got the problems. <clears throat> the people don't want to acknowledge the judgment of God. Let's move on here. It says in verse 10, And the men did so, and took the two milch kine, and tied them to the cart, and shut up their calves at home, and laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, and the coffer with the mice of the golden images of their emeralds. And the kind took the two, uh, took the, excuse me, and the kind took the straight away, the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went and turned not aside to the right hand or the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them under the border of Beth Shemesh. And they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their, their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And, the, and it says in verse 14, And the cart came into the field of Joshua, the, Beth Shem, the Beshemite, and stood there. And there was a great stone, and they claved the wood of the cart and offered uh, the kind a uh, burnt offering unto the Lord. Sorry, Philistines, you're not getting your kind back or your cart. <laughs> We're going to burn it, and, and you're going to burn the cart and the kind. <clears throat> and it says uh, in verse 16, and when, the and when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. And I wonder what they went back and told everybody. Oh, yeah, it was the judgment of God. Turns out it was. We were being judged. Hopefully they went back and got right. Hopefully they went back and you know, took down Dagon and started to consider their ways. But we know that's not what they did. <coughs> and it says in verse 17, And these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord. 
for Ashdod one, for Geza one, for Ashkelon one, for Gath one, and for Ekron one. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities, the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of fenced cities and of country villages, even on the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord. So what's interesting about this is that if you, in the previous chapter, we only read about three cities. There's two additional cities here, Geza and Ashkelon. You know, in chapter four, we only read about three cities being afflicted. But here you read about two more. And that's not a contradiction. It's just that, you know, the, the more details coming out in the story. We also, in chapter four, or excuse me, chapter five, I keep seeing chapter four, I meant chapter five. In chapter five, we didn't read anything about mice. But apparently that's another part of this plague that we're, we're getting more details here at the end. None of these things were mentioned in chapter five. And what we could take away from this is that the consequences of, of sin, you can't fully measure the consequences of sin until it's run its course, until after the fact. You know, people think, well, I'm just going to sin a little bit and the worst that's going to happen is this. But often that's not all that happens. You can't always, you can't always calculate how much sin is going to cost you. And often it's far more than we are willing to pay. It's far more than we are willing to, to suffer for. The worst that could happen is the worst happening. That's what people, oh, I'm going to sin. What's the worst that could happen? The worst. Right. What could happen is the worst. You know, I'm just going to commit fornication. I'm just going to go out and we're just going to, I'm just going to sleep with this person. What's the worst that could happen? I don't know, STD? Maybe somebody gets pregnant and they got an unwanted child. Maybe somebody gets an abortion against your will, whatever. I mean, terrible things happen just from a little bit of sin. I'm just going to go out and get drunk tonight. What's the worst that could happen? Oh, I don't know, car wreck. People could talk you into do something really stupid. I'm just going to steal this. I'm just going to go sneak into somebody's house and steal something. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> get killed? <laughs> Catch a bullet? I mean, who knows? And that's what we see here. You know, the, 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 uh, the Philistines, they see that the ark there, and they're like, man, we want that for a trophy. What's the worst that could happen? Oh, I don't know, golden emeralds and your secret parts? Mice all over your land? Just, being, just thousands of people being killed towards the end? Being taken advantage of by these hyper-spiritual priests who just want to make up all this you know, mumbo-jumbo and get you wasting your time and chasing your tail, doing nothing? <clears throat> you know, that's a, that's a serious warning of the Word of God that, you know, when you're tempted to sin, you should step back and say, how much could this really cost me? Not how much am I willing to pay, but how much could this end up actually costing me if I go ahead and do this? Are these consequences worth the potential, uh, you know, the blowback? The consequences aren't worth it. There's the saying that I've heard many preachers say, and it's true. Sin will, will uh, take you uh, cost you more than you're willing to pay and will keep you there longer than you're willing to stay. Co sin will cost you more than you're willing to pay and will keep you longer than you're willing to stay. That's a true statement. Well, I'm just going to have a little bit of sin and the consequences could just be far beyond what you ever imagined. I don't think the Philistines saw the, the ark that day after they won that victory and thought, this is worth golden em this is worth emeralds. I'll put up with some mice for this. I don't mind if people die. I don't mind if, you know, the whole city gets wiped out. They didn't think that. They just thought, oh, it's ours. We'll just set it up with Dagon. Just a little bit of sin. And it, it cost them severely, as we read in the story. And you say, well, yeah, but they were Philistines. You know, they were, they were the unsaved. They were the heathen. They had it coming. But here's what you have to understand, is that no, nobody, believer or heathen, God's child or not is exempt from God's judgment. I mean, we already referred to Hebrews chapter 12. I won't go over that again. But look here in the story. Verse 19. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, the man that just a few verses ago saw the ark coming and rejoiced. Said, the ark's back. Let's take these Philistines' cart and chop it up and butcher their, their kind as a sacrifice unto the Lord. They're glad the ark's back. They've been missing the ark. And it says there that he, meaning God, smote the men of Beth Shemesh, God's people. Why? Because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Did they set it up in some temple next to some false god? Nope. All they did is say, well, let's just take a peek. Let's just look. Just a little sin. 
he even smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men. 50,000 people for just taking a little look. Just a little sin. Just want to take a little peek inside the ark to see what's in there. Well, just, you know, just go read what's in there. The tablets and Aaron's rod. You know, it was already written down. That's what's in there. But we want to see him, you know. And they should have known that nobody was to be looking in the ark. That was just forbidden. I mean, remember where the ark was supposed to be kept was in the Holy of the Holies, and only one man, the high priest, was allowed to even go in there once a year. And even he ran the chance if he wasn't, you know, had made atonement for himself of dying in there. So they think, well, I'm just going to take a peek, and 50,000 people died. You know, the consequences of sin cannot be fully measured until after the fact. Just like the Philistines. Oh, well, it was just three cities. They get the ark back. Well, it turns out it was five and there were mice. It was, it was way worse than we thought. And what's interesting about this is that, you know, in, at the end of verse uh, 19 there, it says the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. I mean, 50,000 people are dead. And what that shows us is that that the punishment is even, even swifter and more severe for God's people than it was for the Philistines. I mean, I don't know how many people died of, all the, of the Philistines, but I don't think it was 50,000. I don't, I don't recall reading a number. It said it was a very great slaughter, and there was a lot of guys walking, you know, they were walking funny because of their emeralds. But the punishment here is way swifter and way more severe for who? For God's people. And think about the fact that, I mean, we try to rationalize that, humanly speaking. We think, what's the big deal? They just looked in the ark. It's not like they were setting it up next to Dagon. Is it really that big of a deal? They should have known better. Right. They should have had even more respect for the ark. I mean, they started out, right, whoa, let's, let's sacrifice here. Let's break up the cart. Let's make a sacrifice, put this on the stone, and talk about what we're going to do here. Because they're, you know, God obviously understands the circumstances. But, you know, curiosity killed the cat. I mean, it, it killed quite a few cats, in fact. 50,000 of them, you know. Killed the dog, too. You know, the men of Beth Shemesh, they knew better, and they should have acted accordingly. They should have been much more careful about going about how to handle the ark. And God punished them far more severely than he did even the Philistines. It says in verse 20, And the men of Beth Shemesh, Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjarth Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. So at least they're doing them courtesy of saying, Hey, you guys come get it. Instead of the Philistines, they're just like, Just take it over there. <laughs> the Philistines are like, Oh, we're getting smoked with emeralds. Take it over to Gath. Don't even tell them it's coming. You know, take it to the next city and they can deal with it. At least these guys are saying, Hey, come down and get this. And do things right. So what's, what's the lessons we can learn from this chapter here is one don't be simple don't be a simple person you know it is, the, it is not good that the soul be without knowledge you know a wise man increaseth learning the bible says you know we, we instead of wasting time on frivolous and vain things we should be learning you know especially the word of god we should be spending time reading the bible understanding what it says getting familiar with it knowing it and not being a simple person, in, especially when it comes to spiritual matters. Why? Because there's people out there, there are wicked men that lie and wait to deceive. Their whole purpose is to deceive people and take advantage of them. So don't be simple. Don't be deceived by the hyper-spiritual. And finally, don't take the judgment of God as a light thing. I think that's probably the big lesson we can all take is that you know, a little sin can, can lead to a, a, a big judgment. We shouldn't just say, well, it's, you know, I can deal with a little bit of God's chastening. You know, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins is what David prayed. Don't just assume, well, I, I'll just sin and I'll just deal with the consequences later. That's just going to make it worse. Don't take the judgment of God as a light thing. You know, get the ark back where it belongs. Just get it back where it belongs. Let God have the proper place in your life. Let God have the proper place in your life. Put the ark where it belongs. Amen. And let God have his place in your life. You know, what does God want from us? You know, I was thinking about preaching a sermon, and you know, I'll just spit it out right now real quick, is that Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, come unto me all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
I think sometimes people think the Christian life is just this big, long drudgery. And I'm not saying it's not easy. It's, it does, it's, it's, it's easy. It certainly has its difficulties, but it also has its rewards. But really, when you think about it, just on a, on a day-to-day basis, what is it that really God really demands of us to do? Read your Bible. Oh, that's so hard. Read your Bible for 15 to 30 minutes or maybe an hour if you're, you know, wanting to really get into it. Is that really a big, is that really hard? I mean, how much time do we spend scrolling through some app? How many, how many hours do we spend on YouTube? And compared to, I mean, God just wants you to just read the book. Can you just read it once a year? Just, would that be, I mean, that's a pretty light yoke. That's giving God his proper place in your life. You know, go soul winning. Go tell somebody else about Jesus. Well, I don't know if I can do that. Well, somebody did it for you, more than likely. Somebody took the time to preach the gospel to you. You know, because why? Because they went out for one hour once a week at a minimum. I know it's hot. But is it really that? I mean, people endure this heat to do a lot of other things that have no spiritual value. Good night, people run out there. <laughs> you know, people go bike riding in this weather. I don't know what's wrong with them. You know, but they do it. And there's no spiritual gain. Nobody's profiting from that, but maybe then they're getting, you know, maybe a better, you know, maybe their heart rate's better or something, you know? I can't figure out why they do it. But you can't go out for an hour and just tell somebody about the Lord. Well, they might slam the door. Oh, so what? They might, they might think I'm funny. Well, so what? Give God his proper place in your life. That's, that's the lesson here. Put the ark where it belongs. You know, or suffer the consequences. Or suffer the consequences of what? Being simple. Well, I, I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to learn what the Bible says. I'm not going to listen to the preacher. I'm not going to apply these things to my life. Then suffer the consequences. And don't be surprised when, you know, you have a spiritual emerald in your life. Or a spiritual mouse marring the land. Or, you know, some, some false prophets deceiving you and lying you and putting burdens on you and making you do things that you don't even need to be doing. You know, don't be surprised when your cart gets burned up and your milch kind are gone and God's judging you. That's the consequences. And that's the lesson here. That's the thing. We don't have to suffer these consequences. We could just leave the ark where it is, put it where it belongs, and it's, you know, Philistines could just left it there, not suffer the judgment of God. Those in Kirthrachirim, these Beshemites, they could have just not peeked inside and just respected the ark, gave it its proper place, and everything would have been okay. And that's what we need to do. Give God the proper place in our lives or suffer the consequences. Let's pray.